Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, today, uh, I guess we'll be studying in Jeremiah. Uh, you know, we'll continue our, our study in Jeremiah. We'll be in chapter 32 and 33. And, and again, this is just one of those things, but uh, the end of 33, uh, if you're going to listen to anything, the end of 33 is really important. It's something that's really interesting. It's kind of, it's really curious how Yahuwah put, you know, put things, little gems for us to find. And, uh, in, in and and so anyway, the end of thirty three is really interesting. So try to stick around if you can and uh, to watch, you know, let's get to listen to that anyway. Uh, so today is the Sabbath. It's the second Sabbath after first fruits. So in counting of the Omer, we're on day fourteen, and so uh, uh, we'll you know we're going to end up we're going to count uh, forty nine days plus one would be fifty days which would be the word, it's, it's the same, the word for uh, the 50 is penta, and Pentecost means 50 days, so we'll be, you know, we'll be observing Pentecost in, uh, let's see, it'll be five more Sabbaths in one day, so it'll, it'll be on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, and uh, anyway, just so the counting of the, we're, we're in the, in the beginning stages, the, the first two Sabbaths, of seven in counting of the owner and so anyway uh just you know for those that may not know the pentecost or shavuot is the day of the covenants in other words that's when all the covenants were cut in the scripture the blood you know the blood oaths and covenants were cut on uh, shavuot so uh and that's a whole nother study and we won't go into that but uh that's that's the day that uh that Moses came off the mountain. It's the day that Abraham walked between, or Abraham cut the, the animals in two and Yahuwah walked between the pieces. It's the day that Noah uh, had the covenant with a rainbow with Yahuwah. And it's the day of the Adamic with co covenant with Adam. And it's also the day that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, the Rock Kodesh, fell on the assemblies 50 days after uh, first fruits, after the crucifixion of Messiah. So anyway, long story short, today's the new moon. well, yeah, today's also Rosh Kodesh. It's the new moon. And uh, so it's the beginning of the second month. And uh, so uh, anyway, now uh, that's just kind of letting you know where we are. And we also, I guess, in studying the book of Jeremiah, you know, we're studying uh, and uh, it's it's teaching a pretty hard lesson in that the following Yahuwah is not an easy task because Jeremiah, you know, we'll see that uh, Jeremiah has been thrown into prison. We'll see that today. And uh, for just for telling the truth and the king there, if the king of Judah, Zedekiah is uh, upset because Jeremiah is telling him the truth, telling, telling Zedekiah what Yahuwah is telling him to tell him. And, uh, Anyway, so long story short, it's not always easy to follow Yahuwah, but it's the best path. All right. So, uh, well, let's go ahead and, and uh, we'll, let's see. Okay, there we go. I messed up. want to share my screen. Okay. Okay, so we'll be starting in uh, Jeremiah chapter 32, starting in verse 1. And it says, this is the word. Oh, look, before I do this, let's go to Yahuwah in prayer. I almost forgot again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do and the many blessings that you give us. And Father, we just ask that you give us the wisdom to know what your word is actually saying. Father, help us to, to glean a little bit of your wisdom in all that we read and study here today. And Father, we'll give you the praise and the glory because everything we do and we say would be to glorify, to magnify you. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you give us. And Father, we thank you for the Messiah. We thank you for the, the, the ability that you've given us that we can come to you and petition you in prayer and, and have a, a relationship with you. And Father, we thank you so much for all of that. It's only by your grace that we could be able to do that. 
and we thank you so much for that. Father, we ask that you watch over, guide, and protect us. Be with us through this study, and Father, we'll try the best we can to give you the glory. All this we ask and pray in Yahushua's name. Amen. Okay, so verse 1, it says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from Yahuwah in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jer Jeremiah the prophet was imprisoned in the courtyard of the guard, which was in the palace of the king of Judah. Okay, so Zedekiah has Jeremiah locked up, has him in prison because of him telling, but because of Jeremiah telling King Zedekiah that, that uh, he needed to basically let Nebuchadnezzar's army come in and surrender. He needs to, he, he's telling him that he needs to surrender. And he's also saying that if you fight, anyone that fights back is going to end up dying. Anyone that doesn't fight back, anybody that surrenders on their own will be taken into captivity, but they'll have a life in Babylon. And anyone that fights will die. So, I mean, it's, it comes down to if you fight, you die. If you surrender, then you'll live and your, you know, your offspring will live and flourish and be prosperous in Babylon. And then eventually some of your descendants will come back to the nation of Judah and Israel. So it was a, it was a hard choice to make, but it was one that, that Yahuwah told Jeremiah to tell the people. And so, and it, and it played out just like Jeremiah had, had said. Verse three, it says, for Zedekiah, king of Judah was in, had imprisoned him saying, why are you prophesying like this? You claim that Yahuwah says, behold, I'm about to deliver this city into the hand of the king of Babylon and he will capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah will not escape from the hands of the Chaldeans, but he will, he will surely be delivered into your hand, the king of Babylon and will speak with, his, with him face to face and see him eye to eye. He will take Zedekiah to Babylon, where he will stay until I attend to him, declares Yahuwah. If you fight against the Chaldeans, you will not succeed. Jeremiah replied, the word of Yahuwah came to me saying, behold, Hananel, the son of your uncle, Shalom, is coming to you to say, buy for yourself my field at Anathoth, for you have the right of redemption to buy it. Then, as Yahuwah had said, my cousin Hananel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and urged me, please buy my field in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for you own the right of inheritance and redemption, buy it for yourself. Okay, so here, uh, this Hananel is, he, he knows that he's going to be either killed or taken into captivity. So he wants, to, he wants to sell his land. And evidently, he's either wanting to unload it so he'll at least have something, or he maybe knows that Jeremiah is going to be, is, is basically telling the truth. And this, I can't really say. I don't know, I don't know the purpose that he went to him other than, you know, Yahuwah urged him or, or basically told him to do it. So now Jeremiah is going to end up with this property. Well, Jeremiah is one that once he, once, you know, after you do the study, Jeremiah stays, I think, in the nation of Judah. He's not taken away into Babylon, I don't think. I'll have to go back and study that again, but it's been a while since I've read it. But I think he stays in uh, Judah and is not taken away captive. I think he's one that, one of the few that are allowed to, to stay in their homeland. So anyway, he's going to, he's, he is going to buy the land and, uh, you know, it'll be his after that. So, uh, okay. Then he knew that this was the word of Yahuwah. So I bought the field in Anathoth from my cousin, Hannah Mael, and I weighed out 17 shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed, called in witnesses and weighed out the silver on the scales. Then I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy with its terms and conditions, as well as the open copy. And I gave the deed to Baruch, son of Neri, the son of Ma Masaya, in the sight of my cousin Hananel, 
Hannah, Hannah Mail, and the witness and the witnesses who were signing the purchase agreement and all the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the guard. In their sight, I instructed Baruch, this is what Yahuwah Savuot, the Elohim of Israel says, take these deeds, both the sealed copy and the open copy of the deed of purchase and put them in a clay jar and preserve them for a long time. For this is what Yahuwah Savuot, the Elohim of Israel says, houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Okay, so he's doing this to preserve their property, the family, their family inheritance and property. After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neri, I prayed to Yahuwah, O Yahuwah Elohim, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Okay, just so you know, and I know you do, but we've gone through this a lot. It says there at the end of 16, it says, uh, or maybe it's in the beginning, it's 17, I'm sorry. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, which the, when it's speaking of the great power, it's the speaking of the Ruach Kodesh, the voice, the, 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 where Yahuwah speaks and his voice comes out of his mouth. That is the great power, the, the spirit of Yahuwah. That's the Ruach Kodesh and your outstretched arm. The, what is the outstretched arm? Well, the, anytime you see the arm of Yahuwah, you know that's speaking of the Messiah. The word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. So when, when you read John, it, 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 in John chapter one, it says something to the effect that nothing was made that wasn't made by Messiah. Well, the way that all, uh, the way that works is Yahuwah spoke that, everything that exists. He spoke it into existence. And that word that he spoke made, was made flesh and he dwelt among us. So, I mean, so understanding that Yahuwah is one, Yahuwah is not three, he's one, but understanding, you know, how it works is, is really, it's vitally important because if you, if you, if you latch on to the, 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 the idea of the Trinity, then that's a polytheistic idea. And so it's not polytheism. It's, it's not more than one Elohim. It's one. Yahuwah is one. His, his great power, his breath, his spirit, and his outstretched arm is all him. It's nothing else. It's no one else. It's him and him alone. And he did it all. Now, so anyway, understanding that the you know, the Ruach is the breath that comes out of his mouth, the words that come out of his mouth, and the words came out under the power of his breath, which is the Ruach, and those words became flesh, which is the Messiah. Okay, and then it goes on, it says, nothing is too get difficult for you. Verse 18, you show loving devotion to thousands, but lay the iniquity of the fathers into the laps of their children, after them, O great and mighty Elohim, whose name is Yahuwah Savuot, the one great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are, on, are all uh, are on all the ways of the sons of men, to, re to reward each one according to his own or to his ways and according to the fruits of his deeds. So, you know, we are responsible for our, for ourselves and uh, we're going to be held accountable for our own deeds. You perform signs and wonders in the land of Egypt and you do so this, to this very day, both in Israel and among all mankind. And you have made the name for yourself as is the case to this day. You brought your people, Israel, out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. And again, you know, he brought them out with signs and wonders performed by Yahuwah and the strong hand and outstretched arm. We know that that is the Messiah, Yahusha Hamashiach. You gave them this land that you have sworn to give their fathers the land flowing with milk and honey. They came in and possessed it, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They did not obey your voice. Your, their, it's talking about your, his voice, 
is the Messiah. That Messiah, that voice, that word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. Or walk in your law. They didn't follow his instructions. And so uh, that's where people are even today. They failed to perform all that you commanded them to do. And so you brought, so you have brought uh, upon them all this disaster. See how the siege ramps are mounted against the city to capture it and the sword and the famine and the plague. And the city uh, has been given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you have spoken has happened as you see now. So, I mean, we're faced with exactly the same situation here today. We have people that are not walking according to what Yahuwah says, and where they're not following the voice of the Messiah, which is the voice of Yahuwah, which is the law or the Torah. I mean, you can, you can chase, it's like a dog chasing his tail. It's all the same. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, you look at, at Yahusha, he is the, the spoken word of Yahuwah. The spoken word of Yahuwah is the law. It is the Torah. It is the, the word made flesh is the Messiah. I mean, it's, it, he's wrapped up in, in all of it. It's all wrapped up in the Messiah. Uh, okay, I think we're in 25. Is that right? Is that where we are? Yet you, O Yahuwah, have said to me, buy for yourself the field with silver and call in witnesses, even though the city has been delivered into the hands of the Chaldeans. Okay, so this basically, by him doing what he's doing, he's sealing the inheritance of Jerusalem for the most part, uh, I think. And, and sealing, he, you know, at least the, it, it's, a, it's a picture of the remnant that's going to be saved. And so we know that uh, they're going to be in captivity for roughly 70 years, I think. And then after the 70 years, uh, they're going to allow... Uh, was it uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, maybe? I think they're going to allow those guys to come back and start rebuilding the city. So it's going to be like 70 years later, and most of the generation, most of the people, I think, that were taken into captivity will probably be gone, and it'll be their uh, descendants that will be coming back to repopulate uh, Jerusalem. Let's see. 26, it said, then the word came to Jeremiah, behold, I am Yahuwah, the Elohim of all flesh, is anything too difficult for me. Therefore, this is what Yahuwah says, behold, I am about to deliver this city into the hands of the Chaldeans and of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who will capture it. And the Chaldeans who were fighting against this city will come in, set it on fire and burn it, along with the houses of those who provoke me to anger by burning incense to Baal on their rooftops by, and by pouring out drink offerings to other Elohims. For the children of Israel and of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight. For their youth, from their youth, indeed, they have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the work of their hands, declares Yahuwah. For this is a city, or for this city has aroused my wrath and fury from the day it was built until now. Therefore, I will remove it from my presence because of all the evil the children of Israel and Judah have done to provoke me to anger. They, their kings, their officials, their priests and prophets, the men of Judah and the residents of Jerusalem, they have turned their backs on me, not their faces. Though I taught them again and again, they would not listen or respond to discipline. Okay, so... Here, they have access to the Torah. And what they've done is they've taken the Torah, the instructions, the law. They've taken it, and they're not, they, they're not trying to follow it. They're not, they're not trying to follow Yahuwah's instructions. They've turned their backs on Yahuwah and not their faces. And even though Yahuwah has tried and tried and tried to get them to turn back, they haven't turned back. And I mean, and, and the really strange thing is it's exactly the same way today. There's all these churches that are out there that are having church on Sunday morning when the scripture is very clear that, and they know that the Sabbath is on Saturday, 
They've turned their back on Yahuwah. And they're not following the Torah. They're not following the law because they don't want to. Now, here's the thing. So in the New Covenant, we studied this in Jeremiah 31, just last Sabbath. It's where Yahuwah says that he's going to make a new covenant with the, you know, with the houses of Israel and Judah. And he's going to put his word in our hearts and in our mind. And he will be our Elohim. We will be his people. And no more will you have to say that, uh, you know, Yahuwah is our Elohim. Everybody will know that he is, that they will know his name. So Yahuwah takes charge of the covenant at that point. And what he does is he puts his spirit, his Ruach Kodesh within us to let us know when we sin or if we're fixing to sin. That is the benefit of the Ruach. And so by him doing that, now he takes responsibility for us being in covenant. Now, the only way that you can not be in covenant is that if you choose not to follow the Torah, Yahuwah. And if you make that conscious choice, then the Ruach's not going to try to bring you back. He's going let he's, he's going to let you do what you want to do. So in other words, if you, if, you, if you're wanting to stay in covenant with Yahuwah, the Ruach will be there and he will take charge and let you know when you've done something wrong or fixing to do something wrong, hopefully, hopefully before you do it wrong. And so uh, that's, the whole, that's the whole key to being in covenant with Yahuwah. Now he reminds us, he keeps us in line. He keeps the boundary in front of us and it's up to us to follow stay within that boundary. Okay, so uh, those that don't want to follow, you take the modern day churches, they teach that you don't have to follow the Torah, that you don't have to follow the law, that it's all been done away with. Well, you're going to see here in just a little bit, that's absolutely false. Okay, uh, so anyway, we'll get to it in uh, at the end of 33. Okay, verse uh, 34 here. I, when I say at the end of 33, I'm talking about chapter 33. Okay, right now we're in chapter 32, verse 34. They have placed their abominations in the house that bears my name, and so have defiled it. They have built the high places for Baal in the valley of Hinnom to make their sons and daughters pass through the fire to Molech, something I never commanded them, nor had I it entered my mind that they should commit such an abomination and cause judah to sin okay so they defiled the house that bears yahuwah's name and so by doing that you know we know that the house of yahuwah is the or the kingdom of yahuwah is you know is his kingdom and so they have defiled that kingdom that house and they built these high places and the high places you know are uh, places of worship to Baal in the Valley of Hinnom. Now, the Valley of Hinnom in Hebrew is Gehenna, Gehenna, and Gehenna is also known as hell. Okay, when you when you do a study on Gehenna, then you know that that is also considered hell. And what it's talking about here, they would take their sons and their daughters, and they would uh, sacrifice their kids to this ancient deity of Molech. Molech is uh, a picture of the owl. And so uh, that's basically the, the way that, uh, or it's the symbol of Molech, the wisdom of the owl. And so uh, they would actually sacrifice their children to Molech. And again, we just went through the, the pagan holidays of Easter and that's what they did. They, they, they sacrificed their babies uh, that were a year old. They sacrificed them to Molech and the blood they took from the sacrifices and dipped eggs in them and let the other kids want to go out and look for them. That's why that's how you got the Easter celebration. And so uh, here, you know, this is one of the things that they were doing. And it's something that Yahuwah says that he didn't command them to do, and it never entered his mind. This is such an evil, evil thing that Yahuwah 
didn't even enter his mind that people could be that evil, that they should commit such an abomination and cause Yehuda to sin. Okay. Verse 36. Now, therefore, about this city of which you say, it will be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword and by famine and plague. This is what Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel, says. I will surely gather my people from, the, from all the lands to which I have banished them in my furious anger and great wrath. And I, have, and I will return them to this place and to make them dwell in safety. They will be my people and I will be their Elohim. I will give them one heart and one way so that they will always fear me for their own good and for the good of their children after them. Now, you know, this is going to be a multiple fulfillment because he is going to bring them back from the nation scattered all throughout the, the land over there back to Jerusalem. But it's a later fulfillment in that even today, he's doing this from a spiritual sense. He scattered people throughout all the world and all these foreign lands. And right now, as we speak, He's calling people out of these lands, not from a physical standpoint, but from, from a spiritual standpoint. He's calling us out of the paganism that I just got through talking about. And he's calling us out, you know, out of the, these uh, foreign ways of, you know, these pagan ways. He's calling us out of all of that back into following his way of doing things, which is the Torah. And so uh, the, the second exodus, again, I mean, I've talked about this before, but I really believe that the second exodus is a spiritual exodus. I don't, I mean, it might be a physical exodus also, but the thing that really matters is the exodus that really counts is the coming out of the kingdom of the world, moving into the kingdom of Yahuwah. That's the exodus that really, really, really matters. Whether or not we leave the country that we're in and go to another country, I mean, that, that's minor. That's very minor in relationship to us leaving the kingdom of the world and going into the kingdom of Yahuwah, which is a spiritual journey, okay? So, I mean, who cares if we move from here to Jerusalem? Who really cares? I don't think Yahuwah does. He can minister to us right here where we are. Because we know that the temple now is within us. It's within our heart. And so why would he want us to go to another country or another land and leave where we are if he ministers to us exactly where we are? See, I mean, him ministering to us through our own temple, which is within us, is a lot more important than us moving to somewhere different. Okay. Anyway, don't mean to harp on it, but that's just the way it is. Okay, verse 36 says, now therefore this, about this city, which you say, it will be delivered into the king, into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, famine, and plague. This is what Yahuwah Savuot, Yahuwah the Elohim of Israel says, I will surely gather my people from all the lands to which I have banished them in my furious anger and great wrath, and I will return them to this place and make them dwell in safety. They will be my people. I will be their Elohim. I will give them one heart and one way so that they will always fear me for their own good and for the good of the children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never turn away from doing good to them, and I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will never turn away from me. Yes, I will rejoice in doing them good, and I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. So now Yahuwah, again, is taking charge of this covenant, and he's going to He's going to put this fear, if you will, in our hearts. Well, what is that fear? The fear is that Ruach Kodesh. It's his word. It's his spirit. And so the, they put the boundary out. The, the Ruach Kodesh puts the boundary out and keeps us in line. And if we, and we know that if we get out of line, that we're going to be punished with everlasting damnation. We're going to be punished with the, the second death, which is the being put away from Yahuwah. Okay, verse 42, it says, For this is what Yahuwah says, Just as I have brought all the great disaster on this people, so I will bring upon them all the good I have promised them. And fields will be 
brought into this land and about which you are saying it is a desolation without man or beast. It, is, it has been delivered into the hands of the Chaldeans. Fields will be purchased with silver and deeds will be signed, sealed, and witnessed in the land of Benjamin and the areas surrounding Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah and the cities uh, of the high country and the foothills and the Negev and, uh, because I will restore them from captivity, declares Yahuwah. So now, you know, looking at this, it says something to the effect, it's not only in Jerusalem, but it's also in the, the, the surrounding foothills, the Negev, which is a desert, and he will uh, restore them from the captivity. Well, he did bring all these into Jerusalem uh, 70 or so years after the, uh, the Babylonian siege, and but he's also doing it again today again like you know bringing people out of uh, all these foreign lands out of the desert out of the hill country out of everywhere and he's bringing them back to under the understanding that uh yahuwah is uh you know following him is the you know where he's bringing them back to okay bringing them back to following him and his Torah. Okay, verse or chapter 33. <clears throat> okay, chapter 33, verse 1. It says, While Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of Yahuwah came to him a second time. Thus says Yahuwah, who made the earth, Yahuwah, who formed it and established it. And uh, Yahuwah is his name. Call to me, and I will answer and show you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Okay, this is pretty profound. So we turn to Yahuwah, who created the heavens and the earth, and we turn to him, and we call on him, and he shows us things, great and unsearchable things. So he shows us things that aren't written in the scripture. He shows us things that, that's his way of doing things. And so it and, it, and it all comes together and it fits. And so, you know, the, so a lot of the pagan religions, the, the modern religions of today, they see the New Testament and the Old Testament as two completely separate documents. They don't see the connection between the two. They don't see how the, the New Testament is nothing but a, a concise version plus some historical accounts of the Old Testament. They see the Old Testament as being done away with, fulfilled basically in, in their understanding of fulfillment means to be done away with, which is not the case. Messiah said himself that he didn't come to destroy the law or to do away with it. And he, he even says that not even one little bit of it will be destroyed or done away with. And so anyway, uh, even though he says that, I know a lot of people believe that it's been done away with, but we're going to see here in just a little bit that uh, that's absolutely wrong. It says, for this is what Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel, says about the house of the city and the places of the kings of Judah that have been torn down for defense against the siege ramps and the sword. The Chaldeans are coming to fight and to fill those places with corpses of men. I will strike down in my anger and in my wrath. I have hidden my face from the city uh, because all of this wickedness. Now, when you look at it in the prophecies, it talks about cities being devastated or destroyed or uh, in, you know, desolate. What it's actually talking about is where Yahuwah turns his face away from them. And when he turns his face away from them, that's when the cities, that's when everything becomes desolate. And that is a picture of the second death. In other words, the first death is our separation of our soul, our, our spirit, and our human body. That's the first death. Everyone's gonna, everybody is going to uh, eventually at one time uh, have to go through the first death. The second death is where Yahuwah turns his face away from them and, and, 
he, they are taken from his presence. And so that is the second death. And that's a picture. The, what, it, what it's showing here is a picture of that second death, of these cities and these towns, these places that they have gone through the second death, which Yahuwah has turned his back on. Verse 6, nevertheless, I will bring it to health and healing, and I will heal its people and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. So he will reveal to them the abundance of shalom and truth. Okay, we know that shalom, peace, is the doing away of all chaos. And we know that uh, the truth, we know that the word is true. The word is truth. Okay, I will restore Judah and Israel from captivity and I will rebuild them as in the former times and I will cleanse them from all iniquity they have committed against me and I will forgive all their sins of rebellion against me. So this city will bring me renown, joy, praise and glory before all the nations of the earth who will hear of all the good I do for it. They will tremble in awe because of all the goodness and the prosperity that I will provide for it. This is what Yahuwah says. In this, in this place, you will say is a wasteland without man or beast. In the cities of Yehuda and in the streets of Jerusalem are, that are deserted. Inhabited by neither man or beast, there will be uh, heard again the sounds of joy, gladness, and voices of the bride and the bridegroom and the voices of those bringing thank offerings into the house of Yahuwah, saying, Give thanks to Yahuwah Savuot, for Yahuwah is good. His loving devotion endures forever. For this, or for, for I will restore the land from captivity as in former times, says Yahuwah. Okay, so he's speaking here of the second exodus. And so he will restore us from captivity. So we are in, we are now in, we live in the kingdom of the world, which means that we are in Babylon. No two ways to look at it. We are definitely in the kingdom of the world, which is Babylon. And uh, we are in captivity, our physical bodies. Now our spirit is no longer in Babylon. And, you know, for us to be, you know, our, our feet are rooted in Babylon, but our heart, our spirit, our mind, we are in the kingdom of Yahuwah, not in the kingdom of the world. The king in the kingdom of Yahuwah is where, you know, we shouldn't be caught up with what Yahuwah is doing out there. So, you know, we watch the news and we see all the stuff going on out there and, and you know, and, and our, our flesh says it's all bad stuff, but we know in our spirit that Yahuwah is doing it. So it can't be bad. Even though it seems bad, a lot of people are going through a lot of hard times. Yahuwah's doing it because of their, well, they're just not following what he's doing. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're being obstinate against him. They have turned their backs on Yahuwah. And so Yahuwah now is, is disciplining them and they're not accepting the discipline. And so you know, he's going to continue to do it and it's going to, it, it's going to end up like the, 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 uh, uh, in the, in the book of revelation where it talks about, you know, all the destruction that's going to be happening in the book of Daniel and in a lot of the other prophets, it's going to talk, it talks about the destruction and, and all the things that are going to be happening and all that stuff's going to be true. I mean, it's, it's, it's in the prophecies of Yahuwah. And so we know that it's going to happen. So all that's going on right now is, is getting all of us focused and headed toward those, end, those end times. And so, I mean, it has to happen the way that it, it says, so Yahuwah is making it happen. Okay, so, uh, but he's going to restore us to the land, his land, from this captivity that we're in right now. Okay, verse 12, it says, this is what Yahuwah Savuot says. In this place, in this desolate place, without man or beast, without its cities, it will once more be pastures for shepherds and rests for flocks. Okay, this pasture for shepherds and rest for flocks. It's talking about the, the, the sheep, the flocks of Yahuwah. 
which are the people and and uh, the shepherds are the the spiritual leaders and and their congregations and they will be in peace with Yahuwah during this time okay it says in the cities of the hills of the, uh, of the hill of the hill country and foothills in the Negev and in the land of Benjamin in the cities surrounding Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah the flocks will again pass under the the hands of the ones who counts them says Yahuwah okay now here's where it's fixing to here in just a few minutes it's fixing to get really interesting and we're going to hit a side note and chase a few rabbits here Behold, the days coming, declares Yahuwah, when I will fulfill the gracious promise that I have spoken to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, again, I want you to take note. He's talking about the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He doesn't say anything about the Goim, the, the Gentiles. He doesn't say anything about the other nations. It's the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That is who the new covenant is written to not the Goim, not the Gentiles. The only way that the Gentiles, if I, we were raised Gentile, yes, but we have converted, we have been adopted into Je Yehuda by the Messiah by following his Torah. Okay, so now we are Yehuda. You can't be Yehuda and say, or Judah, and say that you're a Gentile and you don't have to follow the Torah. They will, the Gentiles will tell you that, that the Torah is for the Jews. Well, that's correct. You can't be a Jew and a Gentile. If you're going to be a Gentile, then you're not in covenant. You're not a covenant keeper because the, the, the goim literally means not in covenant. If you're going to be in Yehuda, that means that you're in covenant. Now, to be in covenant, it's just like, Revel to put it in a very concise uh, form or verse, it's Revelation 14, 12. Revelation 14, 12, write that down. This is the patience of the saints, those in covenant, those that keep the commandments of Yahuwah and have the faith that Yahusha is the Messiah, Revelation 14, 12. All right, so you have to have both to be in covenant. If you're not in covenant, then you're a Gentile. It doesn't matter what bloodline you are. You can be, I mean, if, if you're a Texan from the United States, or if you're a, a, a Jew from that live in that lives in Jerusalem, a rabbi, it doesn't matter what your bloodline is. If you keep the commandments of Yahuwah and have the faith that Yahusha is a Messiah, then you're in covenant. If you don't do both, then you're a Gentile. You're going, okay? In those days and at that time, I will cause to sprout for David a righteous branch. This righteous branch in Hebrew is a netzer. That netzer is where Yahushua was born, or not born, but that's where he was raised in Nazareth. And uh, that's, it's netzeret. And so, and it goes on, it says, and he will administer justice and righteousness in the land. Now the justice and righteousness, we know that uh, righteousness is defined in the scripture in uh, Deuteronomy, uh, 6, 24, 25, it's, it's defined uh, as uh, it is our righteousness to observe and do all that's written in the book of the law. Okay, so our righteousness, the righteousness that it's speaking of here, he is going to administer justice. Justice is the, is the, the I guess, a legal term that's going to, you know, that he, he will judge between those that are following it or not. He will administer justice, which can be good or it can be bad, depending on which side of the fence you're on, and righteousness in the land. The righteousness, again, is the following of the Torah. In those days, Yehuda will be saved, and Jerusalem will, be, will dwell securely. Uh, and this is the name by which it is often called, Yehuah Zadik, our righteousness. So. Uh, Yahuwah Zadik is uh, by the name which all of this will be called. Okay, for this is what Yahuwah says, 
David will never, okay, I, this is this is what I want you to make sure you, you follow this word for word. For this is what Yahuwah says, David will never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor will the priests who are Levites ever fail to have a man before me to burn, to offer burnt offerings and uh, uh, burnt grain offerings and to present sacrifice. Okay, anyone that says the Levitical priesthood or the law has been done away with flies in the face of what Yahuwah says right here. You need to get this. Okay, now we're gonna, we're gonna chase a few rabbits in this and I want you to understand something. We all know that, that Yahusha is a descendant of David, not only from his, you know, I mean, he's a bloodline descendant from his mother. And if you go to Matthew chapter one, it gives Mary, his mother, it gives her uh, genealogy. Now, if you read it, it looks like it doesn't. At the, at the end in verse 16, in Matthew 1, 16, it looks like it's Joseph's genealogy, his stepfather. Because what it says is that it talks about uh, Joseph, which is the husband of Mary. And then Mary is the mother of Yahushua, the Messiah. But that's not what it says in the Hebrew. There's in, in the Vatican, it's been found, the Hebrew uh, versions of Matthew, which predate all the Greek versions. They are, these are, the Hebrew versions are older than the Greek versions, which means that the Hebrew is actually the original text. What it says in the Hebrew versions, and like I said, there's, there's more than 24 of them that's been found in the Vatican of all places, okay? And what it actually says is Joseph, the father of Mary. And then it talks about Mary being the mother of the Messiah. And even if you go in and you look at the genealogy, it says that there's 14 generations between the exile of Babylon to the Messiah. But if you read it in the English version, there's only 13. And so why is that? It's because of that misinterpretation. That misinterpretation, it puts, it says that Joseph, the husband of Mary, which means that Joseph and Mary are in the same generation, and then the Messiah, which is 13 generations. Okay, but it's Joseph, the father of Mary, which makes an extra generation in there. <clears throat> okay, so long story short, the book of Matthew has a this misinterpretation, and there is 14 generations, and uh, that uh, he is the 14th generation in the book of Matthew, and he is a descendant through Mary, his mother, from King David through Solomon. Solomon is, is David's son, and Solomon is in the line of his uh, generation, or of his descendants, okay? Now, if you go to Luke chapter three, it's very specific. It gives the generations of uh, of him through Joseph, his stepfather. Okay. And so if you read, if you read Luke chapter three, it's very, it's, it's very evident that it says that Joseph was considered his stepfather and it gives his generation. It gives his genealogy and it, his genealogy goes through Nathan, which goes back to David. David had sons. Okay. One was Nathan. One was Solomon. Mary was from the from Solomon and and uh, Joseph was from uh, Nathan. Now, when you get down to Mary, not only her husband was named Joseph, but also her father, and that name is Yahusef. Okay, Yahusef. It was a very common name back then, and Yahusef was her daddy, and yeah, and another Yahusef was her husband. Okay, now so let's we cleared that up. Now, here's where it gets really interesting to me. We know that at the time before Mary gave birth to the Messiah, that she and Elizabeth, which Elizabeth was the wife of Zechariah, Zechariah was a uh, Levitical priest. In fact, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth had John, Yehuchanan, and John was considered the very last Levit legitimate Levitical priest. 
here on earth. Okay. Now, we know that when Mary and Elizabeth got close to each other, well, the baby in, you know, in, in Mary's uh, stomach, the, you know, the Messiah leaped, I'm sorry, in Elizabeth's stomach, I guess, leaped because he got close to the Messiah. <clears throat> and there's one little verse in there that says that they were related, that, that Mary and Elizabeth were related. Now, according to the Torah, this probably shouldn't have happened because the Levitical priests weren't allowed, according to the Torah, to uh, marry outside the Levitical family. Okay. Now, if that's the case, how were Mary and Elizabeth related? Well, the only way that that could happen, in my eyes, now I may be seeing something wrong. If I am, somebody can tell me about it. But somewhere down the line, a Levite had to cross the fence because Mary is definitely a descendant of Judah. Okay. You know, so, and it gives her genealogy. Now, Elizabeth, it doesn't give her genealogy, but it does say that they were related. Okay. So somewhere up the line from Elizabeth and uh, Mary, they had a common ancestor somewhere because they're cousins. Okay, well, how is that if neither one or if, you know, if, if the Levite never married anyone that wasn't a Levite? Okay, well, it, it, it had to happen. There, ha there had to be a Levite cross the fence somewhere. Okay, now let's just, let's just run this out just a minute. Okay, so the scripture's clear that they were related. So let's just assume that somewhere you know, upstream, not assume, but we'll take it as fact that somewhere upstream, a Levite married a Jew. Okay. Had to happen because there's offspring. And then that from that offspring came Mary and Elizabeth, which were cousins. I don't mean to beat this down, but I want you to understand it. Okay. So now let's look at this. That means that Mary not only had Jewish blood, but she had to have Levitical blood also. For her to be related to Elizabeth. All right. Now, if that's the case, in which when we studied a while ago, we said that things that, you know, that Yahuwah shows us things that aren't searchable. Well, this is something that's not searchable, but it's something that has to be. And it's one of those things that, that I think he shows us. Okay. So Mary had to have Levitical blood along with her Jewish blood. Now, <clears throat> when Yahushua was born, that means that now he is not only Jewish, but he has Levitical blood also. He is legitimately a legitimate uh, king through David, and he is a legitimate priest through Aaron or Levi. So when we call Yahushua priest, and king, he is legitimately, through the bloodline, legitimately priest and king, and no one can deny him of those, because he is, he was, he is the bloodline legitimate priest and king. Okay, so some of these little things that we read where just this one little verse where it says that Mary and Elizabeth were related, opens a, an avenue to where it just opens up tremendous information and study about the Messiah that's not written in the scripture, okay? So, Yahushua is legitimately king, and he is legitimately Kohen Haggadah, or the high priest, okay? And the word of Yahuwah came to Jeremiah. Now, uh, that this is what Yahuwah says. <clears throat> if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that the day and the night cease to occupy their appointed times. Okay, if you can figure out how to do all that, to, to separate the covenant between day and night, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, and with my ministers, the Levites, who are priests, so that David will not have a son to reign on his throne. 
So in other words, the only way that, that, that you can deny David not having a descendant who's going to reign on his throne forever is if you can break the covenant between night and day and make them swap places. So I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. As the host of heaven cannot be counted and the sand of the seashore cannot be measured, so too will I multiply my descendants and my servant David and the Levites who minister before me. Now, if these Levites are going to be ministering before Yahuwah forever, forever, get this in, forever, then has the Levitical priesthood been done away with? Absolutely not. You cannot say, preach from the pulpit or whatever you want to do, that the old law has been done away with and we no longer have to follow it. So if you, if, unless Jeremiah is a complete liar and we know that he's not, then if you teach that, that the law has been done away with and that you no longer have to follow it, that Yahushua fulfilled it and we no longer have to follow it, then you are the liar, not the scripture, not Yahuwah. Okay, that's a hard thing to say and a hard thing to think, but I taught this myself for years. I believed it. I believed that that the old law was done away with and that the the new the 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 that Yahuwah was the bad God of the Old Testament and Yahusha was the new God of the uh, the, the good God of the New Testament, and it's completely different, and, it, and the old law was done away with, and the new law was just love your neighbor as yourself and love uh, Yahusha, then, I mean, so we know that all of that is nothing but lies, okay? So the thing is, we know that the, and, and what this is speaking of, again, is Revelation 14, 12. It's the, the keeping of the Torah, the commandments, <coughs> and having the faith that Yahusha is the Messiah. That's exactly what that whole, from 17 through what we've already, what we just got through studying there. From verse 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. That's what, in 23, that's what that is actually saying, okay? So it's Revelation, all that's wrapped up in Revelation 14, 12. This is the patience of the saints, those that keep the commandments of Yahuwah and have the faith in Yahusha the Messiah. Verse 23, moreover, the word of Yahuwah came to Jeremiah. Have you not noticed what these people are saying? Yahuwah has rejected the two families he has uh, chosen. So they despise my people and no longer regard them as a nation. This is what Yahuwah says. I have not established my covenant with the day and the night in the fixed order of the heavens and the earth. Then also, then I would also reject the descendants of Jacob and their servant David, so as to not take from his descendants rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will restore them from captivity and have compassion on them. Okay, so let's look at this just a second. This is funny to me because this is exactly what the modern day churches are teaching. <laughs> have you not noticed what these people are saying? that Yahuwah has rejected the two families, Israel and Judah, or David and, and Jacob, however you want to look at it. Has, he has rejected these two families and replaced it with a modern day church. That's what the people today are saying, that he has rejected the, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and now has, this is replacement theology and has replaced it with the church. Have you not heard preachers preach that? Well, look at what Jeremiah is saying here to us today about what they did back then and are doing it again today. Okay, he rejected the two families that he had chosen. He rejected Israel and Judah, the chosen people, and has replaced it with the church. I don't I just think that, I think that's so funny because evidently they hadn't read, hadn't read any of this. So they despise my people and no longer regard them as a nation. This is what Yahuwah says. If I have not established my covenant with the day and the night and the fixed order of the heavens and the earth, then I would also reject the descendants of Jacob and my servant 
David. Okay, had he not had a covenant, okay, he, basically what he's saying there is the only way that 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 what the people were saying is true. The only way that could be true is if the day and the night got mixed up and didn't didn't know which was which. Okay, so his covenant with the day and the night is solid, rock solid, unchangeable. So the covenant that he has with these two families is also unchangeable, okay? Can't be done away with. Okay, so for him to do away with the two families, he would have to do away with the day and the night covenant also. That isn't going to happen. And so uh, anyway, I want to just encourage you. If you're one of those that uh, – If you're one of those that believe that the Old Testament's been done away with, that the fulfillment there in, uh, you know, in the New Testament where it talks about Yahushua fulfilled the Torah, the law, if you think that it's been done away with, then you need to go back and do some more study because that's exactly, that's, that's what people want to hear because they don't want to follow the Torah. And the thing is, is once you become in covenant, it's not a, Fact, it's not a matter of I have to follow the Torah. It's a matter of I want to follow the Torah. I want to please Yahuwah. I want to, to follow his heart, his everything that he's about. I want to follow his heart. And his heart is based in the Torah with Yahusha, the Messiah. And so that's what the Holy Spirit does for you. It, it, it will draw you to the Torah. The Holy Spirit will never teach anything other than drawing you to the Torah, to the Messiah. And so <clears throat> that's the benefit of the, of the Holy Spirit. If you think you have the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kodesh, and you teach that uh, the law has been done away with, that you don't have to follow it, well, the spirit that you've got is not is not the, the spirit of Yahuwah. It's the spirit of something else, but it's not the spirit of Yahuwah. It's actually a spirit of the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist. So... Uh, just go back and study the, you know, study the scripture for your own self and uh, see what you come up with. But now we'll tell you this. If you're not searching with your whole heart and want to see the truth, he's going to blind you where you're not going to see it anyway. So if you, you know, if you're determined to uh, follow uh, man's religion, which is the modern day religions, if you're determined to follow those and you're, you know, if, if, if that, those modern religions have their hooks in you, then you won't ever see what I'm telling you. And, but if you truly want to know the truth, get on your knees, ask you who to show you the truth, and he will show you the truth if you truly desire it, if you truly mean it. And if you better be, and if he does, does, you better be willing to change because if you don't change, he won't show you anything else. Just the way it works. So anyway, I want to I want to thank everybody for being here today with us. I want to thank Lala for joining us here on the, the Zoom meeting. And, you know, everybody that watches the video, I want to thank everybody. Uh, if you disagree or if you have questions or, you know, something, please leave a leave a comment. Ask me a question. I got a question the other day on some things. And so, uh, you know, I just want to thank uh, I want to thank them for asking questions because how else are we going to learn if we if we don't ask questions so anyway again uh, I guess it's about the end of the study so we'll go ahead and sign off uh, again I want to thank everybody and Shabbat Shalom we'll see you next week you who willing